is greater than my past. He is greater than my dreams. He is greater than my addiction. He is greater than my failures. He is greater than my accomplishments. He is greater than my destiny. He is greater than my fears. He is greater than I. 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 So glad you're here with us this morning. Also want to just tell everybody watching through the internet, hello, thank you for joining in with us. Today, we continue the series we're calling He is Greater Than I. Love that, love that. We've talked about, I tried to talk our team, I'm scared, I probably wouldn't have done it, but we, we talked when we were planning this series that we were going to possibly get somebody to get that tattoo on the platform. And I volunteered knowing that, when, that everybody would say no, that I wouldn't have to actually do that because I'm scared of needles. But it would be cool. I'm going to paint it on there maybe. Maybe I'll just paint it on my arm whenever I get muscles and, and it'll, look, you know, it'll look cool. But I love that concept. He is greater than I. And last week, Pastor Brandon kind of kicked us off with a message that he called greater than fiction. And we talked about how God is so much greater than our imagination. And he used the verse that's on the top of your notes this morning. If you want to go ahead and grab those out, we'll, we'll use this all month long. It's out of the message. It's Ephesians 3.20. And it says, God can do anything, you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. In your wildest dreams, anything that we could ever think of, the greatest thing that we could possibly think of for our lives on this earth, God is greater than all of that. He can do in our lives for us and for our families more than we could ever think or imagine when we submit ourselves to him and give our lives over to him and his plan for us. Now today, today we're going to be talking about our mistakes and we've titled our message, Greater Than My Mistakes. Now, all of us, if we're honest, every one of us have made mistakes before in our life. We've made relationship mistakes and financial mistakes, and some of us have, lots of us, probably, primarily me in this room, have made wardrobe mistakes. I found out a couple of weeks ago that I have had a shirt for over two years that I have worn a lot of times, the whole time, thinking that it was a brown shirt. I was told overwhelmingly by our team a couple of weeks ago when I wore it that it is a gray shirt and it's not a brown shirt. And I was, I mean, I was just flabbergasted. No way that I've wore this shirt for three, two years and it being a gray shirt thinking it's brown the whole time. So I made a mistake. We've made mistakes in our past. Now, some of us have made mistakes and this is what we really want to focus in on this morning. Maybe you've made mistakes in your life and some of us just can't seem to get past some of our mistakes. Maybe it was a bad relationship you got yourself in at, at a young age, or maybe it was some kind of sexual mistake you made early in your life, and it just seems to come up at all of the most inopportune times. And maybe some of you are here today, and you go, Brandon, you just don't know anything about me, and I don't. A lot of you, I don't know your stories, but I can tell you my story. I'll tell you a mistake that I made that to this day haunts me just about every week. And I was about eight years old. No, as a matter of fact, I was about 11 years old, and I was playing in the neighborhood back in the day when kids went outside to play all the time. That was me. We played baseball all the time. And we were in our friend's house, goofing off, resting in between games, getting in the AC. And we just got into this kind of heated conversation about weightlifting. They had some weights in their gym, in their basement. And we got to talking about how much each one of us could lift. And my friend over there told me, he said, I bet you can't do this. And it was a dumbbell sitting over there with a certain amount of weight on it. And many of you don't know me, but some of you know that that's probably the worst thing that you can say to me. Hey, I bet you can't do that. Brandon Matthews figured that out early after we met and has gotten me in more trouble with that phrase than any other thing I think I could do. I've gotten in more trouble hearing, I bet you can't do that. Because then what comes next is, hey, watch this. And that gets me in a lot of trouble. This particular day, that's exactly what happened to me. He said, I bet you can't curl that weight. It probably wasn't 35, 40 pounds, but when you're 12, 35, 40 pounds, may might as well be 1,000 pounds. So I pick up that bar, and I'm going to be a man about it. So I grab it, and I stick my arm extended out. You know, you got to do it right. You can't, you can't hump over or use your back. you got to stand up straight. So I did, and I got that dumbbell about right here. And it curled, but it wasn't me curling it. The dumbbell just came all the way down and hit me right in the mouth and knocked out my front tooth, this one right here. Knocked it clear out. 
I was so embarrassed. I was so upset. I ran split home. I left. I ran home. I mean, the whole time, air getting up in my mouth, hurting, crying, upset, embarrassed. Told my mom. Was so embarrassed that I actually curled weight into my, uh, I didn't want to tell her that's exactly what I did. So I just told her I got in a fight playing football in the backyard and somebody knocked my tooth out. So we went and got an emergency, uh, kind of emergency deal done. She took me to the dentist. Now, early on in my life, my parents didn't have a whole lot of money. We didn't have the best uh, dental insurance. So what they done was they just patched my tooth. They just put some kind of little patch in there to, you know, to keep it from looking completely empty on the front end there. And what happened was we just never went back. We were supposed to go back in a couple of weeks and get the actual final cap on. Well, we didn't do that. And, you know, it just stayed that way. You know, it looks somewhat normal to most people, but I was really subconscious about that. So I always never would show my teeth when I smiled and was really subconscious about making that mistake in my life. And just fast forward a couple of years later, I had met my wife and we were dating at the time. I had, you know, I had already gotten my driver's license. I was about 17 years old. And it was in one October, we had decided that we were going to go all go to a haunted house together. So we went to a haunted house at Sloss Furnace here in Birmingham and we were having a good time. And I took two steps down in one of the areas areas in Sloss Furnace and just bumped my head. I bumped my head on something and wouldn't you know it, my tooth fell out right there in front of everybody. Now, I don't know about you, my wife, I don't think she knew at the time that I had a fake tooth until, until it fell out right then and I was so embarrassed. I mean, I looked like a pumpkin uh, walking out there and then, you know, we still had a long time to go. I wasn't driving. I was with a group of people so I just had to walk the rest of the night with a toothless face and, and it was so embarrassing and seven, four or five years later, I'm reminded of the mistake mistake that I made when I was 12. Hey, watch this. And curled a dumbbell right back into my face. And it was awful. So I went back to the dentist. And again, we didn't have great dental insurance. So what'd they do? They just patched it up. And I thought, well, man, it lasted four years. Surely it'll last a little while longer. So we went and uh, lived on. And fast forward a few more years, two days, guys, two days before my wedding is about to happen. I'm riding down the road in my car, and no lie, I'm not exaggerating, I hit a speed bump in the road, and my tooth falls out of my face. Now listen, at that moment, I am freaking out. Now this is a mistake I'll live with the rest of my life. My tooth's going to fall out every couple of years, and it's going to be at the worst possible time imaginable. So I'm thinking in my mind, I'm getting married in two days. It's not good to go on your honeymoon looking like Bubba Redneck. It is not good. It's not going to be a happy honeymoon when she realizes that I am toothless uh, on, the, on the trip. So I make this emergency stop at the dentist over there, and I said, listen, it's already fallen out at the two worst times in my life. I need you to fix this tooth. So he patched it up and he said, just make it through the honeymoon and when you come back, we'll put a real one in your mouth. We'll actually put a real cap. And we did and I made it through there and he put that real cap on. But I am telling you, to this day, I am self-conscious of I don't want to bump my head. I am scared to death that, I, that my tooth is going to fall out of my head. And it's even, uh, it's even a reminder because you can actually feel in my mouth. I know that's kind of weird to you guys, but I can actually feel in my mouth where that fake tooth is on the back because it's got a little rough edge on the back. So I'm reminded daily. I'm reminded every day when I wake up, when I brush my tooth, when I floss, I'm reminded of the mistake I made when I was 12 years old. And it always seems to come up. And I bet there's some of you probably in the room that have that same sort of history with maybe a mistake you've made in your life. It always seems to pop up at the most inopportune times. It always seems to get you. Maybe it's a mistake you made with your family or with a friend or with the relationship you were in or whatever, but that mistake always seems to bring itself back up at the worst times. And you can't ever seem to get past that mistake. This morning, I wanna read with you a couple of scriptures and I just wanna share with you some things that I've learned in my life that I think think about when the enemy comes to my life and he brings those mistakes up that I've made in my life. And you know, the Bible says that greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. And this month, as we talk about all month long about he is greater than I, I want to encourage you this morning that God is greater than any mistake you've ever made in your life. You may be reminded of those mistakes on a constant, on a constant day-to-day basis, but I want to encourage you this morning that you feel submit yourself to God and we'll give over to his word and listen to his plan for our life, that he is greater than all of those mistakes and whatever the enemy would bring back up to your memory or to your mind. God can conquer all of those things. So I just want to pray with us this morning, and I want us to just dive into our notes and into the message and find out what these things are that God has for us that we need to remind ourselves of. Let's just pray together. Father, I love you. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. God, thank you that no matter the mistakes we've made in our lives, even mistakes like that, me knocking out my tooth, so dumb, so ignorant of me to do something like that at that age. And God, many of us have made simple mistakes like that and it's affected us the rest, our whole lives. And for whatever reason, we haven't been able to get past those. 
God, I pray through your word this morning, we realize that you are greater than any of our mistakes and that we leave here changed. God, maybe we've walked in here depressed or we've walked in here worried or we've walked in here upset because we didn't think we could ever get past that mistake we made. But God, I pray through your word this morning that you open our eyes and you open our hearts and we receive your love, your mercy, and your grace. And God, know that we can leave here changed because you're greater than us. We love you and worship you today in Jesus' name, amen. So the first verse I want to bring to your attention is Isaiah 118. This is just an invitation from God to his people. And he says this, he says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. This morning, God's invitation to us through scripture is, you know what, no matter what the mistake you've made, the thing that you're living with, the stuff that you've having to go through, God can make it completely different. Though it's stained like crimson, it can be white as snow. And again, we're gonna focus on the next verse most of the day today. It's 2 Corinthians five seventeen. I love this verse. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Anybody in Christ, we've accepted him as our savior. We're submitting our lives to him. Anybody in Christ is new. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't come to fix us up? He didn't come to fix what was broken. He came to make it completely brand new. I don't know about you, but that's awesome to me because if Jesus came to fix me, that tooth, man, it just keeps falling out and breaking. Things fixed always break again. But man, he came to just not, not just fix it, but to make it completely brand brand new. So this morning, if you're taking notes, the first thing I remember when I'm in Christ is I am completely forgiven. I am completely forgiven. I love this verse in Psalm 103 and 12. I quote it to myself a lot. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. He says that he will never bring those things up again. Let me remind you this morning, we talk about the mistakes we've made and we're often reminded of those things. Can I tell you, if you've accepted his forgiveness, that the only thing that's ever bringing those things to your memory is the enemy and not the father. It's the enemy and not Jesus. So when those things are brought up against you into your memory and into your, into your life, remember that's the enemy bringing those things back up into your life, but I am completely forgiven. You know, a lot of times we try to find our identity in the mistakes that we made. Let me explain to you. If I steal something, I am a what? A thief. If I kill someone, I am a murderer. If I am addicted to alcohol, I'm an alcoholic. If, I did, if I'm addicted to some drug, I'm a, I'm a drug addict. If, so you find yourselves, and the world labels people with the mistakes that they've made, and often people are never able to get away from those mistakes. Somebody's a thief, they're labeled the rest of their life as a thief because they made a mistake. Somebody killed somebody, they're labeled the rest of their lives as a murderer because of the mistake that they've made. But this morning, I want us to understand that in Christ, we don't don't find our identity in the mistakes that we've made. Because we're in Jesus, we find our identity. We find our identity in the, in the work that Jesus did on the cross for us. Our identity is in him, not in the things that we've done in our lives. And in him, we are completely forgiven. I'll tell you a story. The other day, my wife and I, we fight a lot. Like, not like real like fight, duking it out, but like we, we goof around a lot. And when we do, it always, you know, it's always, you ever heard the phrase, it's all fun and games until somebody gets hurt? Well, in our family, it's all fun and games until Danielle gets hurt. <laughs> it's all fun and games until Danielle gets hurt. So what happened? We, was goof, we were goofing off in the bedroom, and Isabella was in there, and we were, we were fighting. I think I hit her with a pillow, or she had hit me with a pillow, and Isabella was jumping, you know. I've taught her how to do the flying elbow off the, off the bed, and... So she was, we were fighting in the bedroom and, and Danielle had, something happened and she had, she had like swung and I'd grabbed her hand. And you ever tried to make somebody hit themselves? That's what I was doing. I was trying to make my wife hit her. And I said, don't hit yourself, don't hit yourself. And she, she, you know, she's stronger than you think. If, honestly, in reality, my wife could take me. She could whip me if any time. So she pulled her arm back and as she pulled her arm back, my arm went forward and I decked her right in the nose. I'm talking, guys, that was scary. At that moment, the fight was over and I was headed out the door because I knew I, it was not fun anymore. I was about to get whipped. It was about to be on, right? She was upset. Her eyes started watering. She started crying because, I mean, I hit her pretty good. And, you know, and I told her, I said, you know what? I'm just getting you back for all the times you have decked me for no reason. But we were just, we were fighting and I had to ask for forgiveness. Now, with my wife, that's not always the case. You know, she, she forgives, but it's always brought back up again. You remember that time? You remember that time when you did that? But you know what? In Jesus, we are completely 
forgiven, completely 100% forgiven, never to be brought back up again. I wanna tell you a story of a family that we know, very good friends of ours, a lady named Brandy Edenfield. They were part of the church that we were a part of before we moved back here. And I asked her this week if I could just share some of her story because it fits so perfectly with God's grace and his mercy. At 19 years old, Brandy got pregnant. And, uh, and she didn't really have a, a support base at home or whatever with her friends and family, but she chose, she chose abortion out of this pregnancy and out of this relationship. And she said out of that, she just spiraled into a, a year and a half long depression. And she said, I was partying and reckless behavior, all kinds of stuff going on in my life. And she said, one day out of that, she said, I, my grandmother had invited me to church and I went to her church and I gave my heart to Jesus. I gave my life to him. And she said, about six weeks after that, I enrolled into Lee University. It's a Christian college in Tennessee. And she said, I enrolled in the Lee University. And she said, I was thought I was just sold out to Jesus. She said, about a few weeks into, into class, I met a guy who was on a soccer scholarship who really didn't have a relationship with Jesus. He was strictly there to go play soccer and she said it was just a rough relationship and you know what I was finding my identity and the mistakes that I had made and finding my identity in the life that I had and she said I made another mistake and she said we finally eventually broke up and I found out that I was pregnant six weeks after we had broken up she said you know through all of that process and the life that she was living she said about six weeks after that moment after I found out that I was pregnant and and just began to recalculate the past uh, few years in the life that I had been living she said I recommitted my life to Christ and she said I began to start finding my identity in who Jesus was not in who not in the mistakes that I had made because see a lot of us it's here's the thing a lot of us we know we're forgiven and it's good to hear that hey if you ask Jesus for forgiveness and you submit to his will and you repent you're forgiven but a lot of us don't feel forgiven we know we're forgiven, but we really don't feel forgiven. And that was kind of her life. That was the where she was at. She was finding her identity, not in Jesus, who had forgiven her of her past and had forgiven her of her mistakes. She was finding her identity in the things that she had done. And, and you know what? She began to look at her identity in Jesus. And Jesus began to just to do a work in her life. She met her husband. His name is Brian. Just a godly man. These are an incredible family. They now have three beautiful kids and they live in Gulf Shores and listen to what she's doing this this summer later on this summer she's doing an outreach with her church they're calling it exquisite and in this outreach they're going to do an outreach to a hundred single moms with a past just like she's got and in the situation just like she had found herself in finding her identity in herself and in the things that she had done and they're going to present the gospel to them and they're going to love on them and they're going to bless them and it's going to be an incredible day that they're going to do for these women and they're going to do it every year they're going to reach out to single moms and why because because now she's finding her identity in Jesus and he's got a bigger plan than what she had for her life. When she was finding her identity and her mistakes and she didn't realize or understand that she could be completely forgiven, she kept, she kept finding herself back in the same process. But I want you to know this morning, you and Jesus are completely 100% forgiven from the things that you've done in your life. So stop finding your identity in the mistakes that you've made and start finding your identity in the work that Jesus did on the cross for you. Number two, in Christ, I am valuable. In Christ, I am valuable. Now, we've all got things that are valuable, right? Everybody has something that maybe you find valuable in your life. I brought with me today probably one of my most valuable possessions. You may think that's funny, but this is my lucky hat. I love it. It's my, you've probably seen me wear it a bunch. I wear it all the time. It's worn. It is beat up. I've been told I needed to throw it away a lot of times. It's torn up right here, and you can see the back of it in the end. It's dirty. It's nasty. It stinks. Most people don't want to put this on their head, but this is my favorite hat, and I've got some investment in this hat because it's valuable to me. I mean, we've got, what, three national championships wearing this hat. Alabama has just about nearly went undefeated since I've gotten this hat. So to me, it's just a valuable hat. And, you know, we call it superstition. I wear this hat every game day. I do. I just, I I love it. it, To me, it helps us win. Now, I know Alabama's got one of the best coaches in history, and they've got all the best players in history, but to me, we win because I have my hat on. Okay, it's valuable to me. I think I do better. I, I, I play better. If I'm playing a game, I play better with this hat on. If I could preach with it every time I spoke, I think I would preach better with this hat on. It's my lucky hat. I love it. It's valuable to me. But you know what? To you guys, you probably wouldn't give me 50 cents for this hat because I think you would all probably agree with this next statement I'm about to make. Something's value is only, it's only as valuable as somebody is willing to pay for it. Would you agree with that? Something's only worth as much as somebody is willing to pay for it. And though this thing is priceless to me, 
It's probably not to anybody else out there. Though it's important to me, and I love it, and I carry it everywhere because I love to wear this hat, it's probably not to everybody else. And when we think about that, when we think about something is only as valuable as what somebody is willing to pay for it, doesn't that put a new light on what the next verse is in John 3, 16? It shines a whole brand new light on it. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life life. What a brand new shining light it puts on that verse for us. When I realize that I'm only as valuable as something as somebody's willing to pay for me and for you in Christ, God gave you his son. How dare us stand in the shadow of the work that Jesus done on the cross and talk about how unvaluable we are and how worthless we may be because of the mistakes we've made. I want you to know that God loves you and he has a plan for you and a purpose for you and he gave his son for you. You are infinitely valuable to the one that matters most. God loves you and in Christ, I am valuable. Joe Flacco, the quarterback for the, uh, for the uh, Ravens, won the Super Bowl this past year, and now he's probably not the best quarterback in the NFL. I would say he's probably not in the top three or four best quarterbacks in the NFL to me personally, but for whatever reason, boy, they found him valuable. This year, he signed a new deal for $120.6 million. Who would say that is a lot of money? That's a lot of money. That is valuable. More people find him valuable than find my hat valuable. He is a valuable person to that organization because it's only worth, you're only worth what somebody is willing to pay for you. And this morning, I want you to know God gave his son for you. Whatever mistake you've made in your life, whatever thing that keeps grabbing hold of you and dragging you down and stealing your joy, I want you to know you can lay that stuff at the foot of the cross because God gave his son for you and he loves you immeasurably. So in Christ, our value is not determined by the mess you've made. It's not determined by the mistakes we've made. It's determined by the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross for you. And in Jesus, you're completely forgiven and you are valuable to the one who matters most. And then number three, number three, the thing that I think of when maybe my mistakes are brought back up to my life is I am loved unconditionally. I am loved unconditionally. Now, let's be honest. We don't love people unconditionally. Now, everybody, somebody may be out there and go, I love everybody unconditionally. You are lying. You don't love unconditionally. We all love conditionally. We all love people based on how they do for us, if we're just honest. Let me tell you how I know that. Everybody in here, at some point this year, you're going to spend a holiday in a room with people that if you weren't blood kin, you would never step foot on the same property as they are. We call them family, right? We don't. And you know, how about this? Everybody's got weirdos in their family. Everybody's got at least one. Everybody, my family, my family, ooh, my family's got a lot. <laughs> but everybody's, everybody's got one. Now, somebody's in here saying, I don't got a weirdo in my family. Well, <laughs> let me help. You are the man. <laughs> You are wearing the tag, right? But we've all got that. We've all loved people un... We all love people conditionally, not unconditionally. But with Jesus, we're loved unconditionally. There's one person on this earth that honestly I can say I love unconditionally. Now, I'm going to tell you all and I'm going to explain it to you. It's my daughter. She turns three today. Three years ago today, we were, we were scared to death sitting in a hospital fixing to have a baby. Matter of fact, my wife told me the night before, she said, Brandon, I don't think I want to do this. I said, sweetheart, you should have said something nine months ago. <laughs> we can't send her back. It's, it's, she's coming. It's, tomorrow's the day. But I remember when we got pregnant, well, you know, mostly Danielle, she got pregnant. When she got pregnant, I remember thinking, you know, how am I really going to love this girl? How am I going to love her? I mean, I know how I love my friends, and I know how I love my wife. I do love my wife, but honestly, if we're all serious, it's conditional. It's just how we're human. It's all conditional in our love for others, and I began to think, how am I going to really love this girl? I don't know. I've never met her, and we really literally went through nine months. Those of you that are parents, you've probably gone through that process of wondering, what's our relationship going to be like? How is it going to work out? What's it going to do, and how's it going to be? But I remember the day that she was born, I've got, actually, I, I'm not going to show you guys, but I've got just a video log of the whole day, me just freaking out. It was a scary day. I did bring one picture of me in the middle of the birth process. You can go ahead and put it up. That's in the middle. This is, my daughter's fixing to be here, and I am scared. I am freaking out, literally, guys. I'm scared to death 
of, of what's fixing to happen. I am I ready to be a father? Am I ready to be a dad? I'm not, I'm not mature myself. I'm still a big kid myself. I don't know what's going to happen. That's exactly the fear. That is, that's real. That's not fake right there. I'm scared to death at that moment because I'm fixing to meet my daughter for the first time. And I remember when the doctor, you know, they did all that they do in the, in the room there. And he showed my daughter for the first time. And, and I got it. I realized it. I said, well, that's it. I love her unconditionally. It just, boom, there it was. Now let me explain what I mean by that. I didn't love her because the birth process was so beautiful. Now, be honest, it's, it's not beautiful. It's disgusting. Now, women say that because they're drugged up, but us, we're over in the corner shaking, rocking, trying to just get our head straight back on because of what we just were traumatized forever. It is a scary moment. It's not beautiful. It is scary, okay? It's not a beautiful moment. So I didn't love her because the birth process was so beautiful. I didn't even love her because she was so beautiful when I first saw her. Now, let's be honest. Everybody might, you're going to say that you're just an awful dad. Let's be honest. When they first come out of that womb, it is a weird looking thing. It's almost like, congratulations, sweetheart, we just gave birth to an alien. I mean, it's their cone head and they've got, ew, it's just, ugh. I mean, at that moment, it's not because it's such a beautiful thing, okay? Let me go ahead and break it to you single men. When you have, it's not, don't listen to mama when she said how beautiful the process was, okay? It's scary for us. But I loved her because she was mine. That's why I loved her. Not because it was so beautiful or because everything was just perfect, but I loved her because she was mine. And for the first time, I realized it and I understood what unconditional love was. Now, let's be honest, those parents in here, we got some parents in here? Come on, yeah, you know. We got some parents in here. About the first year and a half, your child tries her best to figure out, or his best, to get you not to love them ever again, okay? They turn evil quickly. They don't sleep at night. They, they poop and pee everywhere. They get sick. I mean, it's, it's a gross process. It's not the most flattering process to, to raise a child, and it's not because that she loved, I loved her so much because she was just so perfect. It's not because they're perfect. And it's not because everything's so great. It's because they're yours. I'm gonna share a verse with you and we're gonna spend the rest of our uh, few minutes kind of in this thought process. Romans 8, 38, and he says, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Nothing, nothing can ever separate us from God's love. I'll tell you a story about my daughter. We got in her home. She was a few months old, and I remember walking in her room one day, and uh, she was kind of old. Well, she was much older. She was a very, we were very blessed to have a healthy daughter and a healthy baby girl, and, and I remember her getting a little older, and we walked in one day, and it just smelled awful in her bedroom. I mean, awful. Now, y'all, parents, you, you know, you, they got some smells that you don't even know where they ever come from. It's new. It's like, it's like every child invents a brand new smell sometimes. But it would just smell awful. And what had happened is she had contracted a, a stomach virus, a stomach bug the night before. And, and we didn't know it. And, I mean, she had just, I mean, I'm trying not to be too graphic, but she had, I mean, she had just thrown up all over the place. And it was all over the bed and all over her. And I remember her looking up at me at that moment and, and just crying. And she used to say, she says this all the time, but at that moment she said, Daddy, I want to hold you. And that's her voice to me to say, pick me up, hold me, Daddy. You know what? Here's what I didn't do. I didn't go to her in her room and I didn't say, go clean yourself up and I might come back in here. I didn't tell her that little girls don't make messes like that and you shouldn't do that. You need to clean yourself up and you might be able to come back into my presence. Or maybe if you do, I might come back into your presence. No, I didn't. I picked her up, all the junk, the throw up, everything. I picked her up and I went and I cleaned her off. And, and then I came back and I cleaned up her mess. Why? Because I'm her father and I am bigger than the mess that she made. God is greater than any mistake you would ever make in your life. Anything you could possibly think of or imagine, he is bigger than those mistakes. And there's nothing, not anything you could have ever done in your life that would keep you from the love of God. You are loved unconditionally in your life. He loves you, guys. He loves you. Now, real quick, I want to tell you, because some of you may be here and you're still in that process. You say, but I still can't get past the mistakes that I've made. I mean, I, you're saying all this kind of stuff, and okay, I'm forgiven, but I still can't seem to get past it. I want to tell you, so if you'll flip your notes over really quick on the back, I want to tell you two things that you can go through that's very practical that's going to help you get past your mistakes. Number one 
is you need to tell somebody. You need to tell somebody. A lot of people feel like, man, I've asked God for forgiveness, but always it just seems to pop itself back up again. Well, that's why you need to tell somebody. Maybe you possibly, you really haven't confessed your sins to somebody in this life. A lot of people say, well, I don't have to talk to nobody. That's just me and God. But see, let me tell you something. That's not how God designed it. And we can do it our way and we can fail every time or we can do it God's way and we can, and we can find healing in our life. Listen to what James 5, 16 says. I love this verse. It says, therefore, confess your sins to each other. Maybe we want to underline that, to each other other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. What is that saying? It says that you need to get somebody that you trust on this earth, a friend that's, that loves you and wants to see the best for you in your life. And you need to be accountable to one another. And you need to confess your sins to one another. Let me explain something to you. Jesus forgives us. He does. We're a 100% forgiven. But if you want to find healing in your life, you want to really get past those mistakes that you've made, you find somebody who loves you in your life and get in a small group here at church and, and you build relationships with somebody and you begin to confess those things to one one another. That's where you will find healing. That's where you'll get past those, truly get past those mistakes. You'll find healing in your life. I meet with a group of guys on Thursday nights that really, it started out just me and one other person. And all the whole purpose was, we're just, wanna, we're just gonna be accountable to one another. And you know, there's a lot of times I find myself being holding myself accountable to them. A lot of times more than they, me holding them accountable to their actions. But we're holding, we just hold each other accountable and we love on each other and we pray with one another and we share with one another what's going on in our life. Why? Because that's what brings healing in our lives. You will find healing in your life from all the mistakes that you've made and the things that you've done if you would just tell somebody. Let somebody know what's going on in your life. If you're here this morning, you're not connected into a small group at Cultivate Church, I want to encourage you, man, to get a, get a, a small group directory. and Go ahead and join a small group. Build relationships with people and know that you're not meant to do life alone. You're not meant to walk through your mistakes alone. You're not meant to do it all by yourself. You need somebody in your life that you can be accountable to that can love you and pray with you and be there for you, amen? You need to be accountable to somebody. You need to tell somebody. And then next one, on the list here, uh, on two things that you need to think about is you need to submit to Jesus. You need to submit to Jesus. Maybe you're in here this morning and this is you. You just, you, you, you haven't had a relationship with Jesus. You've never submitted your life to him. You can't get over your mistakes because your mistakes are still eating you up because you've never even been forgiven of those mistakes or given Jesus your life. I love James chapter four, it says this. It says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter into mourning and your joy into gloom. And it says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Can I tell you, there's not a person in this room who haven't made mistakes detrimental to our lives. Every one of us have made mistakes and if we were honest, every one of us, we could probably say we've made some pretty big mistakes. There's not one of us in this room who are not the same. I'm the same as you. I've made mistakes. I could, if, I, if I could sit down and just share with you all the mistakes I've made in my life. But God is faithful. He loves us so unconditionally. He's forgiven us so completely. And we're so valued by him that I promise you today, if you'll submit your life to Jesus Christ, he'll change it and you'll be different than you've ever imagined you could ever be. He will do more work in your life submitted to him and letting him, giving him control over your life than you could ever think or imagine. He'll take you places you never thought you could go. Why? Why? Because he loves you. That's it. There's nothing else to it. He just loves you that much. This morning, I just want to pray with you. I just want to pray with you this morning. You can, if everybody could, just bow your head and close your eyes. I've got a thought for you this morning that I just want to bring. Maybe you're here this morning and you walked in with so much baggage. I've spoken with people just this week that, have, that are just walking in depression because they have so much baggage in their life. They have so many things going on that they just can't seem to get past. Every single time they seem to find a little joy in their life and every single time they seem to get above the things that maybe they've done in their past, something happens that brings it right back up. You know, I, it's very funny. It's kind of funny and it's goofy, but it's that same reminder as when I've knocked my tooth out. It's that... It's that reminder, it just always seems to bring itself back up. And you get to yourself and you go, man, I'm never gonna get past this. I'm never gonna get over this. 
I might as well, if you can, the old cliche says, if you can't beat them, just join them. I'm never going to get over it. But I can tell you today, you can walk out of here different than you ever thought you could be. You can walk out of here defeating the past mistakes that you've made. Why? Because it's not going to be you defeating them. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. It's going to be God defeating them for you. So this morning, maybe you're in this place and you say, Pastor Brandon, man, that's me. I've, I was, I've been so heavy. The mistakes that I've made have just literally beaten me down. And I think about them so often. Because maybe it pops into your mind, I'll never be able to achieve this goal because of the mistakes. I'll never have this job because of the mistakes that I made and the consequences I'm walking through. I'll never be able to have a godly marriage because of the mistakes that we've made together, maybe even before the marriage, or things that just keep dragging you down. And the enemy is just speaking that to your ear. It'll never work. It'll never work. You'll never get ahead. You'll never win. Can I tell you that is the enemy, and it is a lie of the devil. The Bible says that he comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And Jesus said, I came to give you life and life to the fullest. And this morning, I want you to accept his forgiveness. And I want you to know that you can walk out of here different. Don't believe the lie of the enemy in your life this morning. He is greater than I. He is greater than your mistakes. Maybe you're here this morning. I just want to give you this opportunity. Nobody's going to embarrass you. Nobody's going to call you up or embarrass any of you. We just want to be able to pray with you and find freedom in Jesus Christ. All He that is in Christ is a brand new creation. So this morning, if that's you, man, I just want to give my life to Jesus. I want to submit my will to His will, and I want to walk out of here different, free from the mistakes of my past. If that's you this morning, just slip your hand up and slip it right back down. Come on, I see that hand and that one. Come on, maybe online, I see this one over here. Maybe you're online, you're making that decision. Go ahead and make that decision and let somebody know. Tell somebody the mis- of, of, of the decision that you're making to follow Jesus in your life. Anybody else? Come on. It's the best decision you could ever make in your life to give Jesus. Put him number one. Submit his will, your will to his. And then maybe you're here this morning and the first one was you. And you just need, man, I've given Jesus my heart. But, man, it's been hard to find freedom. And this week I'm going to commit myself. I'm going to submit to finding a friend in my life. And I'm going to be accountable to them. And I want to be healed of those mistakes. And I'm going to start living my life on purpose even more so than I have before. If that's you this morning, man, I just want freedom from those mistakes. I just want to pray with you. If that's you, just slip your hands up and slip them back. Come on, I see that one and that one in the back. Come on, I'm proud of you all over this place. For those of you that raised your hands a while ago, I just want to pray with you. You've got in your hand, in your worship guide, there's a connect card. And I just want you to pull that connect card out while we're reverent, while we're in praying, uh, while we're praying. I just want you to check, man, I'm making a commitment to Jesus Christ because we want to be able to give you some next steps that you need to take and to follow and grow in your relationship with Him. Maybe you're here and you're recommitting your life to Jesus. I just want you to go ahead and connect that. Put that on that connect card so that we can send you some more information. But first, even in the midst of doing that, I just want to lead you in a prayer because the Bible says it starts with a commitment. It starts with a confession and a commitment. And this morning, maybe you want to pray in your heart. You can pray out loud or you can pray to yourself. But I just want to lead you in a prayer of commitment to Jesus Christ. Say this with me. Say, Dear Lord, thank you for forgiveness. Thank you that I'm valued. And thank you that you love me unconditionally. I give you my life today. I submit my will to yours. And from this day forward, I commit to living my life on purpose for you. Thank you for salvation. In Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I pray over every hand that went in this place, every hurting person that's carrying the baggage of life around and the mistakes that they've made. God, I pray over their lives and we rebuke the enemy off of them. God, that everything that he would whisper into their ear, God, that it would be null and void. And God, all that they would hear walking from this day out, this day forward, God, they would, they would realize the resounding victory that they have in Jesus. That in Christ, I am brand new. And God, we, it's all level at the cross and it's a clean slate. And God, today we're going to walk out of here different, living our lives on purpose for you. Thank you, Father, for forgiveness, your mercy, and your grace. We'll give you praise for all you do in us. Thank you for the lives that have been touched today. In Jesus' name, amen.